Okay, now we want to move along and talk about some applications of elasticity. There's all kinds of applications for demand and supply elasticities. We'll really just be scratching the surface here, but I want to show you some of these because it's really fascinating what you can do, just a little bit of knowledge of elasticity. Okay, so let's start off with a classic example, revenue maximization. Businesses typically want to increase their revenue, although it's not always the case that larger revenue leads to larger profits, but it often is. So we want to know, do we want to raise or cut the price of the product in order to increase revenues? Now, the law of demand indicates that if you cut the price, you'll increase sales. But will you increase revenues? Well, that depends on elasticity. Is that increase in quantity more or less than proportional to the decrease in price? So let me show you a couple examples. Let's say you're running a cafe and you sell cheeseburgers. And we've got a e calculated elasticity coefficient of 1.5. So they're pretty elastic demand. I just start off with some uh, made up numbers for equilibrium price and quantity to make this example very easy to follow. So let's say you're selling 100 per week at a price of $5. Demand is elastic. That means if we cut price by a certain percentage, we'll have a greater percentage increase in quantity. And that would indeed lead to an increase in revenue. Let me show you. So our revenue is initially 500 here. We're going to cut price by, what is this, uh, $1, so 20%. And our increase in quantity is going to be 1.5 times that. So we're going to have a 30% increase in quantity. So quantity goes from 100 to 130. Revenue now is 520. So we did indeed see a $20 increase in revenue, right? Although we lost some revenue due to the lower price, we gained more than we lost due to the higher quantity. So there you go with elastic demand. When price falls, quantity rises by a proportionally larger amount, leading to increased revenue. Now, does this give us any indication of whether this cafe should decrease the price of cheeseburgers or not? No, not at all. In fact, I'm doubting the cafe is going to decrease the price of cheeseburgers because they only make another $20 and selling an extra 30 burgers. And I'm guessing that the cost per burger is more than a dollar per burger. So costs are going to go up probably by more than $30 in order to gain $20 in revenue. So let's look at the case of a product for which demand is inelastic. And I'm, I'm thinking of what's something that people are really going to want to buy almost regardless of the price. And I come from Colorado, so I know a lot of hardcore Broncos fans, and they were really excited when Peyton Manning won the Super Bowl. And so they want to ha get their gear. They want to get their jerseys and hats and whatnot, and they almost don't care about the price. So let's presume that demand for Peyton Manning jerseys, especially right after he won the Super Bowl, is pretty inelastic, elasticity coefficient 0.5. So initially, they're selling, uh, a, let's say this is just a, a sports gear shop in Denver. They're selling 100 jerseys per week at a price of 50 each. Revenue is $5,000. We know that with demand being inelastic, if we increase price, the, the reduction in quantity will be proportionately less than the price increase. So let's say we increase price by 10%. The reduction in quantity is going to be half that. So the reduction in quantity is going to be only 5%. So what's revenue going to be now? 5225 and here we see that the increase in revenue from the higher price swamped the reduction in revenue that we got from the lower quantity. So here it makes sense to increase price, and it's clear cut. Costs are lower because we're selling fewer items. Revenue is strictly higher. So, so here it's a no-brainer decision. Go ahead and increase that price. And in, so with inelastic demand, if you increase price, quantity falls by a proportionally smaller amount, leading to greater revenue. Okay, so the question of revenue maximization, of course, is highly important in a business setting. And if you're a business manager or an entrepreneur, you can see the importance already of knowing about elasticities. Another business application comes from the arena of price discrimination. Price discrimination is basically the idea of you charge different prices to different customers. If you can find people who are willing to pay more for your product, you can charge them a higher price, maybe increase revenues and increase profits. Now, this is tricky to do, but where it can be done, businesses will do it, and it's going to depend on elasticities. And I'll, I'll show you here an example from the airline industry. This is a pretty well-known example, actually. And most people realize that uh, business travelers pay higher prices for the same flight than leisure travelers. And what's going on here? Well, business travelers have an inelastic demand for flight. Uh, business people have to be in a certain uh, location at a certain time. They need those tickets. They're more willing to pay. Demand is inelastic. Leisure travelers don't necessarily have to be at a certain location over a certain time period. They have a lot of substitutes. They could take a car instead or a bus, or they could uh, do a vacation at home. So a lot more substitutes for the leisure traveler and hence much more elastic demand. 
And you can see here we're starting at the same price level. If the, if the airline can identify who the business travelers are, it will want to increase the prices for them, even for the same flight, remember, knowing that the revenue gain from the higher price offsets the revenue loss from lower quantity on that inelastic demand curve. And if it can identify who the leisure travelers are, it will actually want to decrease the price for them, knowing that the revenue gain from the higher quantity over there offsets the revenue loss from the lower price. So what you see is a sometimes pretty steep differential between uh, airfares paid by business travelers and leisure travelers for the exact same flight. Now, the, the key is how does an airline distinguish between the two? And there's a few different methods they use. The, the one I'm most familiar with is trying to find out how flexible the customer is in the dates of travel. Business travelers, they need to be at a meeting or a conference or some kind of event on a specific day. And so they're not very flexible in terms of their travel schedule, uh, whereas leisure travelers are. Lady, we really need to get to Chicago. It's an emergency. Is there anything you can do? Mm, I can put you in at Salt Lake City by four and there's another flight. I don't have time to go through another city. I need a direct flight to Chicago. Oh, I can reserve you a flight coming back from Chicago at 5.55. Does that help? Hi, I'm Earth. We met? I don't think so. So, you, the airline can kind of probe around and say, are you willing to uh, travel on another day? If the answer is yes, they suspect you, you're more likely to be a leisure traveler. They'll offer you lower prices. So, let's move on and talk about some public policy issues where elasticity plays a big role. One issue on which I think some really basic economic analysis has a lot to add to the debate and discussion, but is really underappreciated in my view is the, the question of prohibition. Can the government effectively outlaw socially undesirable products like alcohol or nar narcotics? If we have a product for which demand is inelastic, and this is the, often the case with narcotic drugs, you know, they're highly addictive and once people get on the drugs, once people develop the habit, they have a craving or in some cases a physiological need for the drug. And so they're willing to pay potentially very high prices to get it. So we're looking at a case where the demand is often very inelastic. Supply can be pretty elastic. And what does prohibition do if we interdict the suppliers? If, if we have the police out there doing drug raids, kicking down doors, um, seizing supplies, what this does is shifts the supply curve up, right? And remember, the supply is the cost curve. Uh, seller costs rise because of the higher fines, penalties if they get caught cost of concealing the production and distribution, cost of operating in the black market, but basically the cost of criminality. So costs go up, means shifting the supply curve up and to the left. But with demand being inelastic, what are we going to see? Are we going to see a big reduction in quantity? No, at our new equilibrium, what we mostly have is a higher price. We have significantly higher price, but a, a paltry reduction in quantity. And what remember the effect on revenues. Revenues it, increase at higher prices for an inelastically demanded good. So the post-prohibition revenue is much higher than pre-prohibition revenue. There's a little bit of a decrease in revenue from the lower quantity, but that's more than offset by the increase in revenue from the higher prices. So what we have now is more revenue, more money to be made in providing this good, but it's an illegal good. So what kind of entrepreneurs are going to be engaged in that business with pretty lucrative potential profits, but high costs of criminality? Well, what we're doing basically is inviting people who specialize in criminal methods to take over these markets completely. And what we might wind up seeing because of this is an increase in violence in return for, for paltry reductions in the usage of, of these illicit products. So you see the cartelization and criminalization of drug markets. The same thing happened in the U U.S. in the 1920s with alcohol prohibition. We had a we had a significant but but not huge decrease in consumption, but that was arguably offset by huge increases in criminality, a lot of murders. We handed over the markets for alcohol to very violent gangs, and instead of engaging in market competition and advertising and, and trying to, to become more efficient and, and pull costs down and then offer lower prices, uh, the way these criminal gangs compete is by going and offing their opponents. So you see a lot of uh, gang fighting a lot of murders and high costs, of course, for the legal system of trying to apprehend and incarcerate all of these thugs. This is why a lot of economists are suggesting that we rethink the war on drugs and shift towards policies of treatment or trying to change people's demand rather than an all out war on supply, which due to the inelasticity of demand is often not very effective in reducing overall use and leads to this um, 
undesired consequence of increasing crime and violence. Okay, so there's just a couple examples. A lot of applied work in microeconomics has to do with elasticities, and there's there's more than we've looked at here. There's uh, cross-price elasticities, there's income elasticities. There's a whole world of analysis that this concept of elasticity opens up to us. But it's important to know elasticity of demand and supply to predict consumer or producer responses to price changes. Okay, so here's a nice little chart that helps us review and summarize. And it's often useful to draw the two demand curves that go through the same point. And the rule is that the steeper demand curve is always the more inelastic one. What we have here is the same price change, the $10 price change on this inelastic demand curve causes a proportionally very small quantity change. But on this elastic demand curve, it causes a proportionally much larger quantity change. I'll close with one little hint here. Inelastic demand curves are very steep and they kind of look more like a capital I for inelastic. And elastic demand curves tend to be much flatter. And if you kind of draw an uh, extra line in here, you can see that it looks like a capital E for elastic. When I saw this short back, I